Good morning, good morning. It is good to be in the house of the Lord to worship and honor Him. Welcome to our time together of praising our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ by listening to His Word through the angels, then to the Apostle John, to the seven churches of the book of Revelations, which is also a reminder for our churches today. May I invite you to open your Bibles to the book of Revelations, chapter 2, verses 1 to 7. And the title of the message this morning is called, Remember Your First Love. Revelations chapter 2, verses 1 to 7. Listen and meditate upon the word of the Lord. To the angel of the church in Ephesus, write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work, your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked men, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name. And have not grown weary. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken your first love. Remember the height from which you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstands from its place. But you have this in your favor. You hit, You hate the practices of Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who is an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. May the Lord add his blessing upon the reading of his word and listening to it. Father in heaven, we are so thankful that your presence is with us as we study your word. Help us through your Holy Spirit to refresh our minds, to remember our first love, to remember the Lord Jesus Christ. And may this letter to the Ephesian church may help us grow in our spiritual lives, continue to serve you, and remember where we have fallen and stand from there and continue on with our service to the King. Help us to know your will. Help us to know your plans and your perspective in our lives as I apply, as we apply your words in our time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and Amen. The book of Revelations, the letter to the church of Ephesus. Many Christians try to stay away from reading and from listening from the book of Revelations written by the Apostle John. It seems incomprehensible to them. When they read, starting from chapter 1, through its pages, they step into a strange and familiar world that talks about a lot of sevens. Seven churches, seven seals, seven trumpets, seven personages, seven bowls, seven dooms, and finally seven new things of angels and demons, lambs, lions, horses, and dragons. Seals are broken, trumpets are blown, and the contents of seven bowls poured out on the earth. People are asking, what do these words mean to us right now? Now, one thing that I want to share with you, brothers and sisters in the Lord, this is very important to us right now as a church, because this is important to the Lord Jesus Christ, the reason why the author, God, used this letter, John the Apostle, to tell us, as what he said in verse 9, that he received this letter from God in the form of visions. Visions that came to him while he was 
on the tiny island, lonely island of Patmos, which lies just off the coast of today's modern day Turkey or Turkey A. Not too far away from Ephesus. It is appropriate that John the Apostle, after listening to the angels, taking the message of God, talks about the church of Ephesus first. Because Ephesus was the largest city of the Roman province of Asia. A very, very important urban city. By the time the gospel was preached, there are so many people live in this city located near the agency. It was a flourishing commercial and export center of Asia. It is very important to the Lord Jesus Christ. It is important to Apostle Paul. Because if you remember, two Sundays ago I talked about Jesus was preached by Apostle Paul in Corinth. And Apostle Paul was accused of introducing another gospel. He faced Gallio. Gallio found him not guilty. He was released. And then from Corinth, he moved to Ephesus. It is appropriate that this church is first addressed in the book of Revelations when we talk about the seven churches because this is a very important place. Ephesus was the largest city in the Roman province of Asia. Ephesus was one of the main urban cities of the empire. A crossroads of traffic, people going from cities to cities. But the main thing you need to know about that is was the fact that it was a gathering place for many different kinds of people to include false religious cults. It was a center of tourism and trade. Four major trade routes went through the city, making Ephesus somewhat cosmopolitan in the ancient world. It was a wealthy city and yet a very, very pagan city. It was home of the largest temple in the ancient world, the pagan temple of Artemis. I show you pictures in there. Picture number one and number two. Actually, this is the remains of the history of the library in Ephesus. I got a picture of that, the group that we went in there. We saw the city. We saw the ruins. Archaeologists still digging. And they found the homes of the rich and famous of the day. One of the rooms, slide number three in there is a room with mosaic floors and walls. And then the place is also important because the author, the writer of the book of Revelations, the Apostle John, was buried also in Ephesus. This is a very important city. A natural city which is full of pagan practices, pagan worshippers, and at the same time, immoral people. And God, through the Apostle Paul, started a church here. And in fairness, even in the midst of those pagan, paganism, immoral society, immoral practices, the church grow into an example of churches in the time of this writing. This book was written like 96 CE or common era. Um, when this was written, it would have been like, Ephesus had been like 40 years old. And during this 40 years old, it had been pastored by great personalities. Apostle Paul, Pastor Timothy, and then the Apostle John himself. Paul came to Ephesus in first century and stayed there to pastor the church or to plant the church and pastor the church 
and stay there for probably three years. And during the writing of the book of Revelations, it was Pastor Timothy leading the church. Can you imagine preaching to the people each week? And people hear the gospel each week. A lot of them. Apostle Paul preaching to the crowd. Not in a building like ours. But in the open theater. Open marketplace. Under the heat of the sun. He became famous. The church became famous also. Because... They have famous member, members that we know of right now, like Priscilla, like Aquila, like Apollos. And tradition says that John brought Mary, the mother of Jesus, to live in Ephesus and that she was buried and we were able to visit the place where John brought Mary, where Mary lived. And died in there. This connects to the Lord Jesus Christ's last words. And this is what I emphasize to the group. When Jesus on his last words said. Woman behold your son. And son behold your mother. He was talking to John and to Mary. And John took care of Mary. And brought him to this place. But when the work of God is so active. And people are hearing the gospel every time. Apostle Paul preached. Pastor Timothy preached. John the Apostle preached. The ministry grows, but the certain, but be certain that someone is not happy about the growth of the church. Satan is not far behind. The longer, the stronger. The desire we have to be close to God. The stronger strength. Power. That Satan will impose. So that we will be taken away. From that desire of our hearts. The scripture tells us. That Satan is our enemy. Who like a roaring lion. Is seeking. Someone. That he may devour. And Satan was so active. In the church of Ephesus. But the church of the Ephesus. Or the Ephesian church. Became a great church. And remained to be a great, great church. Even history tells us. And let that be a reminder. For each one of us. Nothing can stand. In the way of the gospel. For the word of God. Is sharper than two-edged sword that can penetrate to the bones and marrows. Satan could not defeat. Satan doesn't have power. Satan surrendered to the power of God. Now, brothers and sisters in the Lord, my friends, we are living today that makes us think, that makes us feel that we are ministering like in Ephesus. Where the wrong seems right. The right gets twisted to appease the need of other people. Instead of pleasing God, the creator, people wants to please others. Making God nothing. We all should look to the example of this church. And be reminded that with God's indwelling power, with Jesus walking in our midst, nothing can stand on our way. God can use us now as he used the Christians in Ephesus before. Let us examine the message of the Lord Jesus Christ through the angels, to the Apostle John, to the church of Ephesus, and to us right now. Three important reminders that I want to share with you. When the Lord Jesus Christ remember your first love, number one, he reminded them and us of our first love by Jesus appreciating the church for their hard work. Jesus appreciated the church for their hard work. 
Look into verse 2 and 3. Jesus said, I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked men. That you have tested those who claim to be apostles, but are not. And have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. What a commendation. What an appreciation from the Lord Jesus Christ. When he says, you were people who work hard. You were hard workers. This is indeed a commendable thing. Something that should be said about the church, about our church, about the church in the world. For John chapter 9 verse 4 says, As long as it is day, we must do the work of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. This is a good reminder and this is a good time for us to stop and examine ourselves by pondering these questions. Number one, are we working hard for kingdom purposes? Number two, is our work for Jesus a priority in our lives? Brothers and sisters in the Lord, my friends, if you answer yes to both, praise God, you have accepted the reminder of the Lord Jesus Christ. He also said in verse 3, You have persevered and you have endured hardship for my name and have not grown weary. The, the church of Ephesus serve a community which is a very, very challenging community. Pagan worship existed all over especially for those who are rich and famous it was a way of life a career of many a normal practice of those people in the city but they claim they still live godly lives they ministered in time when Christians were being systematically persecuted. Those Christians continued to live as a good example to those people who they want to reach for the gospel. They did not give up. They did not surrender. In Christ's word, you persevered. Endured hardships for my name. They continued to worship. They continued to serve each other in the church and those outside of the church. And when they serve, they made it a point that they witness for Jesus. They stood up against false teachers. They stood up against the Nicolaitans who advocated the political correctness of compromise. Christian who said you could serve Christ and still take part in the pagan practices of that culture. Does it sound familiar? Is it sound familiar? People wanted you to be politically correct so you will not offend anyone. But at the same time you're offending Christ because you are not living the right kind of life pleasing to God. So the question is, are you working and making Christ as a priority in your lives? Or you have others as your priority? Well, the efficient Christians didn't put up with that. Apostle Paul was so effective in teaching. Apostle John, so good in reminding Timothy, pastoring the church, always let them know that when we work for the Lord, we need to do it 100%. They held fast to their faith. Their example is what Paul was thinking of 
when he wrote Hebrews chapter 12, 1, let us run with perseverance and the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. That is what Apostle Paul, Apostle Paul wants to challenge us. Let us focus, let us persevere, let us continue to serve for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ until he comes. Number two, the Lord Jesus Christ reminded the church and us of their first love. When he said in verse four, I hold this against you because you have forsaken your first love. The second point that I want to share, Jesus corrected the church for they lost their first love. You have forsaken your first love. Can be used as condemnation, but so harsh word. Can be used as a criticism, but not a good word to use. That's why Apostle Paul is teaching them to respond to the gospel. Apostle John is writing this, and the word that he used, you have forsaken your first love. Basically, Jesus said, you are decent, hard-working people. You persevere and you stand against evil. You preach the gospel. You share the message of my love. But you, you no longer love me. You no longer love each other. As you first did. The Ephesians, the Christians in Ephesus did all the right thing, but love was lacking. The eagerness, the dedication to the Lord Jesus Christ that they experience when they have encountered Him is not the same as the desire. And as the dedication that they have during the time of writing. What happens when we lose our first love? What happens when we, when we lose the desire to continue to live on that experience that we have? What happens when the passion we once had for Christ is replaced by legalism? What happens when the passion we once have with Christ is replaced by self-righteousness or by a mechanical form of Christianity that contains all the externals but lacks the eternal passion that once steered our hearts and moved us to love Christ and to love His people? What do you think caused this change? What do you think why the Lord Jesus Christ reminded the efficient Christians, the efficient church, and reminded us to love as we loved before? What made the efficient love grow cold? What made your love for the Lord Jesus Christ vanished? For that matter, what makes this kind of thing happen in our Christian life today? Brothers and sisters in the Lord, my friends, the truth is most of us don't lose our first love. No. But instead, we replace our first love with another love. Many of us become content with what we are instead of being driven to become more like Christ. The passion for becoming more like Christ is diminished little by little or maybe totally. 
Instead of comparing ourselves to Jesus, instead of imitating the Lord Jesus Christ, instead of following the Lord Jesus Christ, instead of taking our cross day by day and follow the Lord Jesus Christ, brothers and sisters in the Lord, we begin to compare ourselves with one another. Always reasoning within ourselves that as long as we are better Compared to so and so, we're okay. This attitude self, uh, leads to self righteousness. Self righteousness leads to doing what others end up doing, not according to the will of God, not according to the will of the Father. We bury our love for our Lord under our love of some things in this world that we think are more important than our Lord Jesus Christ. That is what's happening. That's what happened in the Christian life of Ephesians, Christian, in Ephesus church. The secret sin that entangles us, the affairs and busyness of this world that takes our time from the Lord, which is to be for the Lord, even though we know in our hearts that this behavior is something God hates. And yet, people are doing it. And because people are doing it, we go with the flow. Sometimes, our love for God is pushed aside. By our love of popularity and success. We allow ourselves to get too busy. Focusing in our careers. To nurture our relationship with our Heavenly Father. The truth is we can even become too busy in church things. So busy that we forget why we do them. Our schedules become so full of going to meetings. Doing things in this world that we just don't have time to meet with God. But whatever reasons you have, the truth is the sin in the church of Ephesus are still around. And that's why the Lord Jesus Christ keeps reminding them. The members of our churches still needs to reignite that first love. Which is why the ending of this letter is so very important. Number three, to remind them of their first love, the Lord Jesus Christ issues a command to the church. Issues a command to the church. Look into verse five. Remember the height from which you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. On this letter to the churches, you will always find this. God, through the Lord Jesus Christ, will appreciate the Lord Jesus Christ, will correct, I mean like will appreciate the church, will correct the church, and then later on will have a command for the church. And this is what God is commanding. This is what Jesus commands to us. In this verse is very specific. And they are to remember. We are to remember. Where we failed. And then repent. That's it. Jesus is saying. We must do whatever it takes. To remember the past. Back. When this is what happened to the life of the prodigal son. Remember that? As he stood in that pig pen, feeding the pigs, even like eating what he served, the pigs, he stopped and he remembered what his life had been like before. He left home. Back when his love for his father was first in his life, he did not stop there. He repented. He asked for forgiveness, first to God and then to his father. This is the first love that cost Peter 
to ask the Lord to forgive him when the Lord reminded him, telling him that unless the rooster crows, you have denied me three times. Peter did not stop, but he repented. He asked for forgiveness. He turned around. And then he preached a great sermon about the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the first love where Apostle Paul, then Saul, who was the former persecutor of Christians, because of Jesus' love to him and his love to the Lord Jesus Christ, Saul asked for forgiveness, repented, and he became the famous church planter and writer and encourager. They all remember their first love. But one more. This is when David experienced the blessings of God after he committed adultery and murder that caused him to pray to the Father and said, Restore to me the joy of thy salvation and renew a right spirit within me. Brothers and sisters in the Lord, it's not enough. It's not enough. To remember where we have sinned. It is advisable for us to repent. To get back our first love. To repair the damages that comes from not living and loving as we first did. We must remember what Jesus has done for us. We must remember the days when our love for him was first in our lives. And Jesus says, repent. Once we have seen how far we have fallen. Once we see the gap between the way we are now living and the way we used to live. Brothers and sisters in the Lord, my friends, we must bridge the gap through genuine repentance. We must turn our life around, making a conscious vow to do whatever it takes to make our relationship with Jesus right Again, let us do the things we did at first. Remember, love is an emotion, but it grows out of committed action. So to get our first love back, we must do the things we first did. Recognizing the Lord Jesus Christ as the author of life, as the King of Kings, as the powerful Savior, as the good shepherd, and re reconnect to that mind before. The good news about Christianity is that we can stand every time we fall. There is a need to, there's no need to stay down. We need to stand up. When the world hits us in the head, let's stand up. Stand up and start all over again. You may be dizzy because of what the world will do to you. But brothers and sisters in the Lord, my friends, the power of God is better than the power of this world. For greater is he that is in us than he who is in this world. With the power of the Holy Spirit in us, we can stand. With the power of the Holy Spirit in us, we can turn around and recognize that everything happens for a reason. And God has a plan in all the steps we make. Repent. Stop doing the things that we know we should not do. We can rearrange our priorities. We can change. We can put God first again in our lives. Let me close with this. Jesus warns the efficient Christians. That if they will not do these things, or to us, if we do not do change our ways, if we keep going down the wrong road, if we keep following the crowd in this world, we will, he will remove our lampstand from its place. Now, he's not saying that he'll throw us in hell. No. He is simply warning us that he can use us 
if we don't repent. If we hide our light, he will use other lights. If the saltiness in us, for we are called the salt of this world, if the saltiness in us will not be effective anymore, then God will use others, other believers. Remember, the love you felt, the stirring in your heart, the adoration you had for the Savior when you accepted Him as your Lord and Savior. Do you remember how grateful you were for the forgiveness of your sin? Do you remember how at that moment nothing else matters? Only Jesus. And you are so excited. We are so excited to share the message to others because we want them like us to become like us, to be with the Savior, to be in heaven with us. And you want good news. The church at Ephesus heeded this warning. And Jesus promises that if we do these things, we will be given the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the garden of paradise. This is a way of saying that as long as we remember, repent, and stand, will enjoy the caliber of life, the caliber of relationship with God, just like before. This is the letter of Jesus Christ to the angel, to Apostle John, to the church in Ephesus, and to each one of us, and maybe his letter to you. Remember where thou hast fallen. Repent from your sin. Accept the Lord Jesus Christ in your heart. Let him be your Savior and Lord. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your goodness in our lives and for this message today. Help us to rededicate our lives. Help us to repent from our sins so that we will glorify your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Brothers and sisters in the Lord, my friends, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all thy ways, acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. In the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen. God bless you all.